Welcome in. Guys, we have got another Down the Local in the Box with Special. This week we are joined by the Dave Callas. Dave, how are you, my friend? I'm good, mate. I'm good, mate. How are you doing? Everything all right? I, I am very good. I am very good. So, people, um, Dave has been on various things we've done in the past. He was involved in our charity draft we done last year. Uh, he has Flopped. been the Lord. <laughs> he has been the Lord Admiral Nelson to my Captain Bird's Eye on Sea of Thieves multiple times. Um, a great streamer, knocking out lots of Sea of Thieves. And very soon, we will be doing a little bit of a collab with Earth Mode Dan as well on a bit of Valheim. I've been building up my man. Nice. He's looking, I, I just need to work out how to get him clothed now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long cycle. But today we are here to talk about Dave's um, football stuff. We can tell Dave is a proper Mancunian because he's got I a am. Man City shirt on. I am, I am, I am. No, not these down, down south manx. That's not me. That's not me. <laughs> cool. So we will jump straight into this. So Dave, what is your first real memory of football? You'll like this one, mate. You'll like this one. So it's I actually had to research this match because I couldn't remember if it was 96 or 97. Oh, and I checked. Yeah. 1997, Main Road, Manchester City versus Reading. Um, I'm not going to like this, am I? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester City versus Reading. It was in the league. And it's yeah. not like a full memory of the game. So I don't remember the whole game. But also, backstory to going to the City games, right? When I was yeah. little, I was... Because... Obviously, we weren't very good back then, right? So yeah. I was little, and all I was the only City fan at school. The only City fan in my school. Everyone else was United. And it was, my mum's a United fan, by the way, and my dad's Ooh. a City fan. Yeah. So it was good fun oh, on Derby nice. Day. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we went to... We were, my dad used to take me to the City games every single week because he used to sell the tickets at half time. It's called the half-time draw ticket. So before the yes. game... Yeah, we get there about an hour or so before the game kicked off maybe even a bit longer. And he'd stand there and he'd be shouting, half time, draw tickets, like this. Yeah. And if he sold so many, he'd get a kid's ticket for free. So nice. he'd, pay for, he'd pay for his own ticket and then he'd get a kid's ticket for free. Um, so that's how we used to, so we essentially, we had a season ticket, but it wasn't a proper season ticket. So the first yeah. game I remember, I'd have been about, I checked it, it was actually October 97. So right. I'd have been seven years old, almost eight years old. Um, and it's not a full memory of the game that I remember, but I just remember looking up at the scoreboard and just seeing City and Reading. And I don't know why, it's just stuck with me like that for as long as I yeah. remember, obviously. Uh, we ended up winning that game 3-2, though, so... Yeah, yeah, so I told you I wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I only remember that because I checked the score. I don't remember the score, but... That's so that really was memory, a proper memory of, of football, yeah. So that was season one at the Majeski Stadium, then. Was it Majeski uh, you went to? No, no, it was at Main Road. It was at Main Road. Oh, is that so Main Road? Might... Sorry, oh, sorry, yeah, you didn't yeah, go yeah, down to Reading. Oh, OK, oh, I was no, going to no, say... No, no. Yeah, you did say Main Road, road actually, yeah. Um, oh, in that case, I'll take a 3-2 loss at Main Road. Uh, <laughs> didn't want to be losing at home. It was in division, did, I, division 1, though. It was in Division 1. Yeah, the old Division 1 as well, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, yes. What well, is it, now the it, Championship? Oh, okay. So you, so then City must have been relegated that season or the season after? Season 96, we went down the first time, I think. But then you went then down we again, went... didn't you? Because then you beat Gillingham in the playoff final. So we went down, we went down 97, 98. Yeah. And then we came back up 98, 99 and went back yeah. up again 99, 2000. Yeah, yeah. Because the Got 98, promotion. the 98, 99, I remember vividly of Man City beating Gillingham because I'd gone to, a, I'd gone to a gig. I think we talked about this before. I'd gone yeah, to a yeah, gig yeah. at uh, Brixton Academy and yeah. Noel Gallagher was playing and Liam turned up smashed after the game in his City shirt. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> well, I went, I told you, I think I told you before, I went with me, my cousins and, yeah. and their dad. And I went, there was me and my dad and my cousins all went down on the coach. Yeah. And we sat separately in the stadium. Yeah. And this is a game that I do remember fully. I was a bit older then. So we sat separately in the stadium. And obviously we were 2-0 down in like the 88th minute, 89th yeah, yeah. minute. Paul um, Dickoff became a hero. Was it Paul Dickoff? Kevin Orlock first scored the first one. And then Paul yeah. Dickoff scored the second one. So... Just we were 2 0 down about the 88th minute, 87th minute, or whatever before Horlock scored. My cousins and their dads they went out, they left the first time, and then as they left, we smacked in the two goals as they were leaving Wembley. So he blagged his way back in for extra time, <laughs> sat for yeah. extra time, and then when it went to penalties, he left again because he thought we're never going to win on the penalties. So he took his kids out again, but me and my dad stayed for the whole thing, watched the whole thing, saw Nicky Weaver do his lap of honor around the pitch and everything. Loved it, brilliant, brilliant. Loved it. I, I, 
people who leave early, uh, it, it baffles me, especially if you're going down on the coach, yeah. because you can't yeah, yeah. go anywhere any quicker. People go, oh, I want to beat, yeah. I want to beat the traffic. <laughs> okay, I kind of get it, but you paid your money. Wait until the traffic's gone and stay a little bit longer. Yeah. I remember going with my old man to a Reading game uh, and we played Slough Town in the FA Cup. And I mean, this is when we were really, really bad. And um, it was local (laughs) derby. (laughs) Local derby, third round of the FA Cup, I think it was. And we were 3-1 down in the 90th minute. And the the ground emptied. And I mean, we're talking, this is Elm Park. So I I would imagine there was only 11,000 people there. But the ground emptied. There was probably about 4,000 people left. And Reading scored in the 92nd and 94th minute to draw 3-3 and then won the replay 3-2. And it's like, I just didn't get it. I just think of all the games. Like I never, when I had a season ticket, so obviously I I don't live in the UK now for anyone watching that that doesn't know. I don't live in the UK, so I don't go to the games anymore. So call me a plastic fan if you like. (laughs) (laughs) I don't go to the games anymore. But I did obviously used to have a season ticket at the Etihad as well. Yeah. And I'm just thinking of all the games that I've been to over time, because we've got this thing as City fans, called Typical City. And we still have it now. Even though we're good now, we still have it. And nothing epitomizes Typical City more than the Gillingham game and the QPR game in in 2012, right? Where you just think you're going to cock it up. You just think you're going to cock it up. And then all of a sudden, we just turn it around and or we do the opposite and we throw it away right at the end as well. But I'm just thinking about all those times that people could have left early and missed these moments. It's not just City, obviously. It's, It's... Football so many teams are there. Look, look at United in the Champions League final. Obviously, I don't know if any, you know, no one that yeah. I know of left early then. But no, what no. if United finally jumped out the stadium then before Sheringham and Solskjaer had scored those goals? Do you know what I mean? It's, you'd you'd it's be mortified, mortified on that just, one, wouldn't you? <laughs> just. Cool. So moving on, question number two: What is the first major tournament, international tournament, that you remember? Okay. Yeah, and uh, what is it you remember most clearly? So I have memories of Euro 96, but I don't remember it. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if those memories are just because I've seen replays of Gaza in tears and all that so many times. I don't think I actually remember it. I just, I was alive for it. So my first proper one was was 98 World Cup. That was the first proper one that I remember. Right, yeah. Um, And the most, the thing that sticks out the most is obviously the Argentina game. Um, Yes. Beckham being sent off. Yeah. And the thing that sticks out the most to me, and I remember where I was stood when this happened, yeah. uh, was Sol Campbell's disallowed goal. Yes, right? the header, um, and it was, uh, was it Shearer, Shearer, got done, Shearer got done for elbowing the keeper, which I stand by today wasn't, no. back in 98, that wasn't a foul. It would be a foul nah. today, but back in 1998, that wasn't a foul. Well, nowadays, it'd probably be reviewed on VAR and it'd get sent off, but... <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah, it's sent <laughs> yeah. off for violent conduct or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... I remember it. I remember exactly. So my mum and dad used to run a pub in Manchester called the Old House at Home. It was in yeah. uh, Withington. It was in near Didsbury. And this is when Didsbury wasn't as nice an area as it is now. <laughs> um, but I remember we were stood outside looking through the window of the pub yeah. at the big screen of the game. Obviously, we were. I was allowed in the pub and my mates yeah, that yeah. I was with were allowed in the pub because mum and dad ran the pub. Yeah. But it was packed, obviously, because England were playing Argentina. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I remember standing on the outside looking through the window at the big screen and I just see Sol Campbell scoring and wheeling away and me and about four of my mates outside going crazy, crazy. <laughs> and then just seeing it being disallowed and then obviously losing on penalties afterwards was just... So that's my earliest memory of an international tournament anyway. Cool. Heartbreak, which it usually Heartbreak. is with England. Standard, yeah, standard England <laughs> process, isn't it? Oh, dear. Yeah, I, I remember that one very well. I think I was in a pub watching that. I would have just turned 18 couple of months earlier and yeah, yeah yeah watching that game i think i think it was the the columbia one was the first one that properly stood out with the beckham free kick and i think anderton scored and I yeah we Jesus. we what a legend only ever fit for an international <laughs> tournament what a hero know, right? <laughs> <laughs> injured from august through to march has a few great games between march and may and gets a call up what a what a hero um yeah, yeah. uh but yeah i think that that was definitely one of the standout moments and I think you know and as I've said on numerous ones of these it's so good talking to people because everyone I've interviewed is younger than me so it brings back all those nostalgic feelings and thoughts that I had from the time and it's yeah but much like you said putting things together so like the World Cup 90 was probably one of my most memorable bits but actually some of it is probably pulled together through 
um, just videos, watching highlights and, and, and past exactly. yeah, replays. That's it. Same exactly. with me for Euro '96. Same with Euro '96. Yeah. I, I I know it happened. I was six years old when it happened, so I don't yeah. remember it properly. But um, for sure. But think, funny thing is. I remember 98, clear, not clear as day, but as clear as I yeah. can for an eight-year-old. But I don't remember Euro 2000. Did nothing just happen in, did nothing happen in Euro 2000 or something? I just don't remember it at all. It's like my memory skips to the 2002 World Cup. Yeah, it's probably a I good thing. I just don't remember. We, <laughs> we, we were, we were um, dross. I think we beat a rubbish German team 1-0, but we got yeah. beat by Romania. A, a legendary lunge from Phil Neville gave away a penalty. And I'm thinking... Is it Valerie Moldovan or something like that? Some Romanian legend at the time. He probably ended up signing for West Ham because most of them did at the time. <laughs> um, scored a pen, but then there was a few others. But we, yeah, we were we were bad. We were really That's bad. It. But Shearer yeah. scored for a one 0 win against Germany, and we we celebrated it like it was the best thing in the world ever. But then we beat five one a year later. That's yes. it. We still got about the five one friendly that we beat them in, don't we? So we can't. I know that was that wasn't a friend. That wasn't a that wasn't a friendly. That was a qualifier. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was a qualifier. Yeah, yeah. I was the, friendly. Yeah, no, because in the return game was when uh, uh, they beat us 1-0. Um, D- Diddy Hamann hit a free kick from miles out. And that was when Kevin Keegan went, uh, we didn't qualify. We had to go through the playoffs, didn't we, against Scotland? Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, Kevin Keegan stepped down just before the playoffs. Was it Kevin Keegan stepped down just before the playoffs? Which year is this? 2000? 2001 or 2002. Okay, that was... Yeah, it, yeah, it would have been be just after he left the city job then, because we saw he was still manager of city in ninety nine two thousand. Our yeah. first season back in the Premier League, he was he was still our manager then. Yeah, yeah, and then oh well, maybe maybe it was earlier than that. Ninety nine two thousand. Still our and manager. It just... must have been earlier because he was our manager until Stuart Pearce took over in two thousand and three. Stuart Pearce took over maybe. So I think we had Keegan until yes. Quite a bit. It... Yeah, yeah, may, it may well have been actually. Keegan took a Keegan left the job in the qualifier for the two thousand Euros. Then that may have been the qualifier. Maybe because yeah. Sven was in charge, wasn't he, for two thousand and one? Sven was in, the in charge in two thousand and two. Yeah, yeah. yeah two so World Cup was Sven. Yeah, yeah. So it must have been Keegan. He must have done a bunk then, and we got Sven in after. Cool. Anyway, so yeah, so ninety eight World Cup. Your your biggest memory. Uh, of an international tournament, the Argentina game. It's all the Owen goal. I didn't even mention the Owen goal. The Michael no. Owen goal. Yeah, everyone wanted to be a Michael Owen after that. Yeah. yeah. Now no one wants to be Michael Owen, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no. He's the only I, I, person. Michael Owen is the only person that I know that's played for like huge clubs: Liverpool, Real Madrid, Man United. Even you can throw in Newcastle as well, and of course the mighty Stoke. But none of them, none of them like him. Not even Liverpool fans like him. No, because he was like, a turncoat and went and played for Man U. Yeah, that's it. That's what I mean. It's just no one, no one likes him at Real Madrid because he barely played. Yeah. Newcastle, they don't like him because he sat and took all the money, apparently, took all the money and slagged off Alan Shearer. He wasn't at United long enough to, to do anything and he was just it's, too old at Stoke, wasn't he? Stoke was just a paycheck, wasn't it? It was like, I don't want to yeah. retire. I need to, I need to feed some extra grain to my horses. So uh, <laughs> we'll take some pay here. We're going, we're going to play with Crouchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he used, to, he used to turn up at my university. I went to University of Chester. That's where he's from. He yeah, used yeah. To turn up at my university a lot, Michael Owen. Yeah, he didn't have it's a university a degree, though, did he? Probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> doctorate, maybe, maybe, maybe one of those passed on ones. But yeah, oh, the honorary no. doctorate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about it. Okay, cool. So, moving on. Question number three: When you played, what was your most consistent position? Where did you play most regularly? So. I was all over the place because I was never amazing anywhere, yeah. right? So I played up front, playing the crouchy role. I'm six foot four, so I used to be chucked up front when I was a kid. I was always the tallest kid. So yeah. I took up front, banged the ball up to him, put in some crosses, see if he can edit it in, and I couldn't. <laughs> so then they, mo- <laughs> so then they moved me to, <laughs> then they moved me to. Where did I play after that? I played right midfield for a little while, which was daft because I've never been able to run either. So yeah. I can't run up. I can put in a cross, though. I can pass. That's one thing I'm good at is passing. I've yeah. got a good pass on me. So if you stick me centre midfield, no one ever did this, but if you stick me centre midfield, I can ping passes, but I yeah. can't run. So there's no point in, you know, I need a bit of protection around me in the midfield. Yeah, and yeah, few yeah. Runners. The most, the place where I got most success, let's say, was when I played in college. So we're talking about 15, 16 years ago now. Yeah. And I played left back. 
probably because they didn't know where else to stick me. But at the time, I had a throw in like Rory DeLapp. I'm telling you, <laughs> I used to be able to throw it in just straight down the line to anyone who was faster than I was just to get it into the fast lads up front because yeah. that's all we did. So there was me, uh, Ticker played in that team as well. So there was me, Tick there was oh, Ticker. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So me and Ticker played in defense in that team. And a couple, another one of our mates, well, we're all mates, obviously. It was weird, actually. We weren't all mates. Like, it was, it was weird. So the defense, we were all mates and used to hang around with each other at college all the time. Yeah. And then the strikers used to hang around with each other and were mates at college all the time. And in the daytime, we'd never mix. But as yeah. soon as it came to playing football, we were a really good team, which was weird yeah. because we never, ever, ever used to mix out away from training or away okay. from playing in games. But we did so, so well in that college team. We ended up getting screwed. And you, if you ever talk to Ticker about this, ask him. We ended up getting screwed by the, the system, let's say, of right. the college teams. For some reason, we ended up having to play this team that were first at the time. We were second. Twice. So instead of playing them twice, decided we'll play them once and just split the halves into games. So we'll take the score at half time as one game and take the other score as another game. Anyway, we got screwed. So moving on, I played left yeah. back in that team and they stuck me there because I had this monster throw in. So anywhere up and down the left-hand side, I'd just hurl it into the box like Rory DeLapp. Yeah. So that's where I got the most success anyway, probably at left okay, back, which cool. is a bit sad, sad to say, really, left back. Yeah, well, no, left back. Someone's, right. Someone's yeah, got exactly. a play there, haven't they? <laughs> Do you know what? I've, managing a team, I've had a... I used a, a creative midfielder and I put him at left back. He was right footed, creative midfielder, and I put him at left Guardiola. back. Purely because, well, because he could pa spray passes and he was switched on enough to be able to defend and track. Um, but when he was playing as an attacking midfielder, he it was congested. And and I thought, you know, he's not able to use a full range of passes. So give him the ball here, the French can play across and he can switch the play and actually do that. Oh like, yeah, yeah, Pep Guardiola. I remember yeah. other teams. I remember a team. Fabian Delph at left back. No, nah, he was definitely better than Delph. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't just a runner and kamikaze. <laughs> he also wasn't a dirty turncoat. Um, <laughs> uh, I quite like Fabian Delph. I did until he, he said came, he came. I'm not leaving Villa. I'm signing a new contract, but you need to put an eight million pound buyout clause so I can bugger off to Man City next week. <laughs> well, I'm not complaining. He came to us. One is a couple of leagues, so I'm not going to moan at him. <laughs> Um, cool, yeah. So basically, uh, Dave would have been an absolute legend on FM20, where long throws were a good thing. FM21, it's kind of been phased out a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you would have had a season of glory, at least a season set pieces. of glory. I'd have been good at set pieces anyway. That's it, yeah. <laughs> set piece cool. glitch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, next question if you could have done something different that would have enhanced or maximised your footballing ability, what would it have been? It's hard to say. So, as I said before, when I was in Manchester, so I left Manchester when I was nine, right? Okay. My mum and dad moved. We moved to Stoke-on-Trent when I was, when I was right. nine years old. Okay, yeah. Um, and when I was in Manchester, obviously we lived pretty much, first when I was, when I was young, young, I'm talking like, three to five years old. We lived in yeah. the city centre. That's where the pub yeah. was that they ran. Then we moved a little bit further out of the city centre, but we were still in the city. And obviously with the job that mum and dad did, they had to be in the pub a lot of the time. Yeah. So when I came home from school, um, I'd usually go around to the next door neighbours. Mm -hmm. And the only time we'd have to play football would be just that little bit of time in the back garden there, just knocking it around a bit. Obviously yeah. at the pub, we didn't have a back garden. We had a car park and we couldn't play football yeah. there because there was cars parked on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with my mum and dad working in the pub, there was no chance of me getting down to training. There was no chance of me getting mm. down to a, a games on a Sunday regularly. So I, yeah. I couldn't play football when I was young, young, talking, you know, like when yeah, kids yeah. get started, six, seven, eight, nine years old, when yeah. they get started. So I never got started into 11 aside football or, or proper football until I was outside of Manchester when I was, I think the first team I played for was when I was probably about 11 or 12 years old. Right, okay. So, although it's probably outside of my control a little bit, yeah. one thing I would have done differently for sure would, would have started 11-a-side football or a lot younger. Yeah. And then yeah. something I could have controlled was just working on myself a bit more. I've never been one to be interested in, in fitness, in, in getting 
healthy and in shape for football, you know, for sports. Yeah, yeah. I've always loved football, but I'm more of a, you know, I love, I love playing football. But if I wanted to improve and actually make something of football, yeah. just more practice, you know, it's obvious, the obvious things, more practice, looking yeah, after yeah. myself a bit more, getting into some kind of physical shape to be able to run around for more than 10 minutes without blowing out my backside, basically. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. So, cool. Okay, so then moving on, final question. Top five attributes that you think make up the complete footballer. So we're not position specific. We are looking at the first five things that someone should needs to have to be top class. Physical attributes or, or everything? Like take it, passive, take it as like, take it as attributes that you would see on football manager. So could be mental, could be physical, could be mental, technical. physical attributes. Crossing yeah. twenty. Uh, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, right. So, especially today in in yeah. like modern football, yes. you've got to be. I think you've got to be vert- versatile. You can't stick to one position now. Yes, right, you can't. I mean, you can obviously. You can be okay. I am a defensive midfielder, and I'm going to sit in front of the, the 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 back three or four, and I'm going to sit behind the creative players, yeah. and I'm just going to monitor that area, like the Claude Makélélé role or whatever. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I think that worked really well back early 2000s when Jose Mourinho had Ch- Chelsea team with Makélélé in it, and it worked. He could just sit there and just break up the play, tackle it. Yeah. Now I think you've got to be more of like a Fernandinho style. I think Fernandinho has taken that Makélélé role of sitting in front of the defence but behind the attacking yeah. players, but he's moulded it more into someone who can also not just tackle, but he's got the ability to bring the ball out of that area as well. He's not just tackling yeah. it and getting it to the, the attacking players or the more creative players as soon as he can. You yeah. know what I mean? He's, he's taking that ball and he's, he's moving it out of that midfield now. And he's even creating attacks himself sometimes not yeah. often but sometimes i know his job is more to break up the play but yeah. you've got to be able to play now i think or, or at least have knowledge of more than one position even if you're like yes. for for example going back again gary neville was a right back yeah and the guy played right back you wouldn't yeah. go past the halfway line no right? in fact i tell a lie i went to he one did. manchester united game once and it was Middlesbrough versus United at Old Trafford and Gary Neville scored a goal. So he must have gone past the halfway line at some point. Yeah, but it was probably the only goal. So you've got a proper <laughs> you've got a proper memory there because he didn't score many. <laughs> Not at all. So in general, though, he never went past that halfway line. And that's sort of how old fullbacks used to be, right? They never used yeah, to go yeah. past that halfway line. But the modern fullback now, the sort of Cal Walkers, Hector Bellerins, uh, Andy Robertson, Trent Alexander Arnolds, you have to be able to attack even sometimes more than defend now. Yeah, they're essentially defensive wingers now, aren't they? Yeah, 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 that's exactly it, exactly it. So the first thing I'd say is you have to be able to be versatile. You can't just stick anymore to one position. Just just going back onto you, you said, said about Fernandinho there as well, and I think it's, it's quite key that Fernandinho is seemingly actually set the bar, as you say, and it's almost four Brazilian players in that ilk. Because you've got Fernandinho, but you've now got Fabinho as well, who does a very similar job. Yeah. And you've yeah, got yeah. Douglas Luiz at Villa mm-hmm. doing the same, who clearly learned some of those attributes from Fernandinho from at Fernandinho. Man City. Yeah, yeah maybe, but you've maybe. got those, but they're all Brazilians. All these guys yeah. that are always known for their te- technical prowess are actually mm-hmm. starting to build up those roles. Because even if you go back to the Brazil teams that were successful in the 90s, um, you had Carlos Dunga who was an out-and-out defensive midfielder, a track and whacker, who Mm -hmm. didn't have the finesse or anything else. He literally just kept it simple and passing it. So, yeah, yeah, it is really good to see Fernandinho's taking that role on. And there's a lot of younger players coming through who are actually doing exactly the same sort of thing. Look at at the Brazilians in general just seem to be the ones. Obviously, there's other players that do it, but the most... I, I tend to see the most how can I say this? Like tactical advancement. Is that a good way of putting it? I guess like sort of changing the way that positions are played comes a lot from Brazilian players. Even back in the nineties, look at Roberto Carlos back in the nineties. He was a left back. Yeah. How many free kicks, goals, Cafu as well on the right hand side. Yeah. You've got Edison now, Edison, who is a goalkeeper that has 
basically revolutionized the goalkeeping position. Him and obviously yeah. Neuer before him, okay, but yeah. How many keepers before Neuer came along? Edison, I guess Allison is is okay at to it, an extent, but he's yeah. Brazilian as well. But yeah. how many keepers before these guys played with their feet, right? Exactly. Yeah, the, yeah. And I don't care what anyone says. Joe Hart for that sort of mid 2010 run was the best goalkeeper yeah. in the league, but he yeah. was an out and out shot stopper. Goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Goalkeeper, shot stopper, right? Commanding the area, wouldn't leave his 18 yard box. He's there to shot stops and he was good at doing it as well. David De Gea yeah. is the same. He was there to shot and he still is now, I guess. He can't, he's one of the ones, uh, obviously, he was brilliant for his time and he was the best keeper in the league at, at one point, yeah. but. Now he's sort of almost been left behind by that position now because yeah. people are looking at the goalkeepers as something complete as, as part of the play now. Yeah. So again, proving my point that you need to be able to do more than just a specialty in one thing. Goalkeepers are almost a first line of attack now. And there also seems to be, especially looking at the England side of things, there seems to be a very clear age separation. Nick Pope, I would mm-hmm. say, is a shot stopper. His distribution from feet and his footwork isn't great he's 28 i think you've got people like fraser forster you said joe hart all of those guys who were the goalkeepers 10 years ago and nick pope now um not great with their feet but then you go to the sort of 25 26 year olds and you've got your pickford who is quite good with his feet sometimes a little bit too overconfident with it but quite good with his feet he's just not good with his arms that's all he's he's just he's just crap with his hands yeah um and you've got henderson as well Dean Henderson, yeah. good with his feet, a bit younger again. And it, and you know, there is a very clear sort of between the age, if you're 28 and over, you're a shot stopper. And if mm-hmm. you're sort of 27 and younger, you're a bit more of a sweeper keeper. Yeah. And it, it's really weird that there is that clear split. But you look at it in the league now, and, and how many how many teams, how many of the top teams, top eight, ten teams now, yeah. will go for an out-and-out stopper now? Yeah, none. not many. They'll, they'd rather go if they're going for a goalkeeper now. They'll go for a keeper that they, that can play with their feet, right? Yeah. So it's it's one of those, and <laughs> I'm going to get maybe I'll get stick for this because I'm a City fan, obviously. But this is this is something that Pep's brought in. I'm sorry, but it's something that Pep has brought in. They told him, and they told him when he came, you ain't going to get away with doing what you want to do in England. Yep. And since he came in, the bar for playing football has been raised. Yeah. And everywhere he's gone, the bar for playing has been raised. When he took over Barcelona, the the need for how many points you need to get to win and the style of play, the tiki-taka style of play of that yeah, Barcelona yeah. team set the standard then. Everybody yeah. wanted to play tiki-taka. Yeah, right? yeah. Bayern Munich, all right, it's Bayern Munich. He didn't have a massive impact. Because we all forget, everyone says Pep walks into easy teams and it's dead easy for him to just take over, slot in, and he's got Messi and he's got all these great players that he goes to, but that Barcelona team that Rijkaard left, I know we've gone off track a little bit here, so yeah, I'm sorry, no, no, you're right. that Barcelona team that Rijkaard left was not a great Barcelona team. They had good no. players, but it wasn't a great Barcelona team. It wasn't storming the league like no, no, it no. was from 2008 onwards when, when Pep took over. Yep. And okay, yeah, he might've got lucky having Messi coming into it and, and whatever, yeah, but yes, Messi was a kid yeah. then. Yeah. Messi was a kid. Iniesta was a kid. They were all kids back yeah. then. All right, he had some old heads. He had, you know, but he shifted on some old heads as well. Etu, Deco, yeah. he shifted on after a while. You know, and he, he he had some experience, of course, but he changed the way that team played. He yeah. put that the three in the midfield with the the Xavi, the biscuits, and the Iniesta. He yeah. started that stuff. The the two out wide and the one up front. That was his tiki taka, and he started it. Yeah. When he went to Barcelona, uh, Bayern, they just won the quadruple. So there's, obviously, there's not a lot to improve there. But yeah. He kept them as dominant as what they are, I suppose. And he turned yeah. Neuer into that sweeper keeper that we see Neuer is now. Yeah. And then obviously coming to City, oh, he's just he just slapped himself into a good team again. That City team that he took over, it wasn't great, mate. It really wasn't. That last season under Pellegrini, uh, we weren't good. We weren't good. No. You know, we, we were okay. We were still top four, but we scraped it. If you remember at the end of Pellegrini's run, okay, we got to a Champions League semi-final, but we were scared if we'd make the Champions League the next season. Yeah, yeah. We weren't great. We were not great. And he came in, he had a lot of deadwood that he had to shift. Yes. He gets again, he gets told. I mean, we've just gone to a Guardiola rant now. I am sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he gets told that, you know, oh, he just came in and he just bought whoever he wanted. It's because he had to. He had a 30-odd year old Pablo Zabaleta and 
uh, Bakary Sanyu on the right hand side of defense. He had Gail yeah. Klesi and Alexander Kolarov on the left side of defense. <laughs> Joe Hart, who doesn't play the way he wanted him to play. You yeah. know, he had a lot of players that he needed to shift out, and he had to really turn that squad from an aging squad that had been together for a long time. Yeah. Look at Tottenham now. They're a squad that have been together for a long time. And I don't think Mourinho's helped going in there and, and playing the way that he's playing, but that squad's been together since basically po- po- yeah. Pochettino went in and, and built that squad. Yeah. And after a while, a squad just needs refreshing. Yeah. And that's what happened at City. That's what happens in at Tottenham. So Tottenham need to, to, to get a lot of players in. They need a big change. They do. That's yeah. They that, I mean, they've, they've been gradually getting rid of players and gradually bringing players in, but it needs a yeah. bigger overhaul in this country. Well, they've just been happening. doing it one at a time, two at a time, yeah. whatever it is. It needs. A, a lot of big changes yeah. To, yeah to just freshen it up just to make you know people players get too comfortable together yeah okay Those so cycles where were we versatile so, <laughs> so that, versatile that number attribute one. number one <laughs> uh, that was number one you want five of these do you so yeah, that yeah, was yeah. number one <laughs> <laughs> mrs badge you're gonna have a lot of editing to do so that was number one <laughs> number two uh number two uh i've kind of used everything up on number one there number two <laughs> I would, <laughs> I would say you need to have. This is away from football in general, but to be a yeah. success in football today, yeah, you need to. It's hard because obviously footballers are humans, right? But yeah, I think you just need to stay away from interacting with people. Yeah, like like on. I mean, I'm talking like social media online. Okay, stay yeah. away from it because it's no good for your mental health side of things. Yeah. The abuse that these, these guys are getting online is, is just, it's, it's horrible. Obviously you see it almost every week now that so-and-so has been racially abused or so-and-so has been abused and forced offline because he's had a bad touch in a bad game or something like that. And yeah, I feel, I feel like that's the wrong thing to say. They shouldn't have to stay away from social media. Obviously these, like I said, these guys are humans as well. Yeah, yeah. They, they should be allowed to go on social media and in, and you know enjoy the things that normal people enjoy. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's just too too much. I think it's too much too stressful for them. Um, I don't think it's good for most people's mental health. And and I'm for I know I'm not getting abused every day on social media, and I still don't think yeah, yeah. it's good for anyone in general's mental health. Um, yeah. So I think either you need incredibly incredibly thick skin and that's not me saying that the guys that have been abused don't have thick skin i'm sure they do and it's just too much but yeah i know to I stay on it to stay on it with the abuse that they take and to be able to put up with that you need to have incredibly incredibly thick skin and that's yeah. not just abuse from the stands because when it's abuse from the stands there's 30 40 50 000 people and when they're all giving you abuse i'm sure it's horrible but you can't pick a face out the crowd most of the time and no. it's just general abuse okay i'm getting you know i'm, I'm getting abuse from sixty thousand people that's horrible but and when a lot you're of on players, social media go on. yeah a lot of players actually say when unless it is all sixty thousand people abusing them at once a lot of players say they're so in the zone within uh the game that they don't necessarily hear it and a lot hear of the it, time yeah. and, and you sort of say about the um when is the racism a lot of the times the players who are being racially abused miss it. And it's only when it's brought to their attention by someone else that you see the issues. Sometimes it's, it's a lot clearer. I mean, when you said the things in Italy where um, a black player would go and take a corner and they'd have banana skins thrown at them. I mean, that's, that's obvious, but a lot of the time, as you say, it's, it's kind of um, not missed, but the focus is so on the game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, They they kind of, it's picked up. Well, they're they're, they're trained on it. They're trained to have a hundred percent. Yeah. Ignore what's going on around you. Yeah, focus on the game. So they've been mentally tuned to ignore what's going on around them. So, like I say, yeah. unless it's everybody, like these instances you see in, in Russia or whatever or wherever it happens, yeah. where they're, they're just booing uh, one of the players because of his skin color or whatever it might be. Yeah, and obviously you're gonna you're gonna hear it. But like I say, if it's just one or two individuals, you, they might not pick it up. But when yeah. it's online and these these guys that are posting it on on the social media, the abuse that they're getting. Ian Wright, when I saw that one, Ian Wright posted, and he's not even playing anymore. Ian Wright no, he no. retired a long, long time ago, yeah, yeah. and he's still getting it from you know people online. You've got to have, and like I say, I'm not saying that these guys they are to be able to put up with this kind of stuff. It shows that they've got incredibly thick skin. Yes, but you need to have incredibly thick skin to be able to put up with any sort of abuse online. 
yeah, any yeah. sort of abuse. Obviously, racial abuse is is up there as one of the worst that it can be. But any sort of abuse online, yeah. you need to have incredibly, incredibly thick skin to be able to put up with it. And I don't blame, I don't blame these players now that just get you know a PR person to handle their social media accounts. And people complain when they put out things like, "Oh, great win today, another three points." We march yeah. on to next game, and you can tell it's just come from you this know, post standard, this on yeah. your social media or someone else has done it for him, you know. But I, I, I can't blame him at all. That's probably what I would do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it either, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's something they have to put up with a lot more than the regular person has to put up with, and you need to have incredibly thick skin to be able to do it. Yeah. Just, just saying about the posts of having the social media people. Why didn't Jolien Lescott just once say, you know, that was my social media person who put the picture of the Ferrari up? It wasn't me. It wasn't oh, pocket done. <laughs> come out and do, come out and do a Joe Hart. Did you see the one Joe Hart did the other week when Spurs lost three 0 and he yeah. thought, he, well, I say he thought his social media fella or, or lady had put up, you know, good good win lads, well done, and three nil underneath it, and he went and lost three nil instead. Jesus wept. Oh, he had to come out and apologise the next day. So it can backfire, I suppose, having a social media person, but I'd yeah. do it. I'd do it. I wouldn't be able to handle it. No, no. So I, I suppose from that one, uh, you say th- I think it, we can look at that almost as like a dedication to, you know, it, it's a dedication to your your career, isn't it? Because it's yeah. okay. it, it's saying, do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna negate all of this stuff that normal everyday people would have, so that I can focus on this without the abuse, almost to mm-hmm. an extent, because you know. It's the thick skin. It's also the not going down to peer pressure would be part of it as well. Uh, yeah. Surrounding yourself with the right people and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, yeah. But so, it's... number three. Oh, sorry, just to add to yeah, that. No, no, go watching, for it. Yeah, yeah. I was watching an interview the other day with, uh, you probably know, Ned, you know, Ned Manua. Yes. City yeah, players, yeah. Play for QPR and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the lads, I say one of the lads, the lad that does the main City fan channel on YouTube, Mm-hmm. Uh, he interviewed Ned and Manure, and one of the questions that he asked him was, how does it feel as a footballer to sort of miss out on being a normal person throughout your 20s? Because throughout my 20s, you know, I was out every weekend clubbing, you know, just dossing about, basically. You don't, you don't yep. really think about that life. But when you're a footballer, you are a professional from the age that you're 18, so yeah. when you retire at the age of 34, 35, whatever it is, yeah. and you miss out on that portion of your life mm-hmm. of being a 20-year-old kid, basically. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Going yeah, yeah. on a lad's holiday, going on, you know, going out at the weekends with your mates, going to a university or whatever it might be, and experiencing those things. Of course, you're well reimbursed for those sort of things. You know, you're not, I'm not saying that they're hard done by by missing that, but a lot of people, I think, forget that the footballers are human beings as well, mm-hmm. and they miss out on one of those standard human being things, I think, which yep. is growing up and, and and doing these things with your mates that normal people get to do. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So that takes a toll on your mental health as well. So having yeah. very strong mental health, dedication to your career yeah. is something definitely that you, that you need, for sure. And actually, just to sort of follow on as well, it's... Uh because it just triggered a memory that I've got. Um, the the dedication, it's even more so since I would say 2005, 2006 with camera phones, social media and everything else. Because before that, it didn't, re- it didn't really see it because I remember being in Falaraki in 1999 as a 19-year-old and we met uh, a guy who had recently signed for Reading from Man United called Grant Brebner. He was a Scotland under 21 international. We met him there. He was on holiday with his mates. He was off his tree. Absolutely destroyed. Good on him. Um, And his mates were going around with a football, just getting him to do, and he was absolutely smashed. (laughs) And he, and we basically, they were saying, they were putting bets with people to try and get drinks out of stuff. And one of the bets was, can he put this ball through your legs from 30 metres? The, the guy could barely stand up, but he'd done it. He, co- he cost us 10 quid each. They walked That's away with... Man United. Exactly. They, they walked away with 900 quid just from him doing that. He could barely stand up, but he kicked the ball 30 metres through the legs. But, you know, if that had been, if, if that had been now, 
that would have been filmed. It would have been snapped. Yeah, it would have been yeah. all over social media. He probably would have been reprimanded at the club. They probably would have hailed him a little bit as well, because if you can do that at 30 metres, you know, well done, son. But yeah. That's why we reprimand. signed you, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Imagine how far you can do it if you're sober. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, yes, cool. Number three. Number three. Uh, let's go into some more, like, I guess, football-related, like, directly pitch-related, I guess. Yes. Uh, attributes. Um, you need to be able... It's going to sound daft because it's one of the basics, but you need to be able to to. How can I put this? I don't just say pass. That's such a d- dumb thing to say. You need to be able to pass, obviously, but you need to have. You can't get away with any more now. Not having an ability to pick out a pass. Yeah, yeah. Especially now, because like I say, when Pep came over and changed the game as he has done, you he's <laughs> you. Everyone has to pass. The goalkeeper has to pass. Your centre-backs yeah. have to pass. Your left-backs now cut inside or your right-backs now cut inside and they have to pass. Yeah. Obviously, your attacking players have always been needed to pick out a pass somewhere and set up a striker to score a goal uh, and whatever. But now it's everybody. How yeah. many defenders now are ball-playing defenders? Yes. Right? You've, you, there's, there's not many Terry Butchers or Tony Adams around now that are just hard men that will just whack you and give the ball again to a midfielder. Yeah, right. There's not many defenders there now that are just there for stopping you. Mm -hmm. A lot of defenders are there now to take the ball off the goalkeeper a lot of the time and bring the ball out from defense and pick out some of them. Look at John Stones. Um, I'm obviously going off City players because that's who I watch the most. But John Stones now can pick out a pass from defense. He can knock it all the way out to the left wing and, and put it on a sixpence out there. Do you know what I mean? So everybody now needs a certain level of yeah. passing accuracy. And I know yeah, that's obviously yeah. a basic in football, but again, in the past, some players, all right, they can't, they can pick out a 10 yard pass. That's fine. Defender, yeah. as long as he can smash into a lad, nick the ball off him and play that first pass out. He's yeah. good. Yeah. But now with the ball, 11 players are involved in the attack and 11 players are involved in the defense. Yeah. So you need to be able to pick out a pass from anywhere on the pitch, basically. Yeah. And I, and I think that's key. And I think, actually, a part of that has come into play gradually over a 30-year period. I think ever since they ruled out the back pass, true, maybe it, it's gradually had to progress okay, yeah. because I remember seeing like highlights of a game and Liverpool needed to win. And it was probably mid-80s and they were 1-0 up and they had to win to win the game. And I remember Grobelar throwing the ball out to Alan Hansen, who took a touch, gave it back to Grobelar, who picked it up, up. who ran to the other side of the pitch or ran to the other side of his area to throw it very quickly to Mark Lawrenson, who'd done exactly the same. And they'd done that for a good two minutes just to kill time. Whereas now you do that, the goalkeeper's then, it's gone back to him. He's got to be able to play the football a little bit. Do you, got, just run out of, do you reckon they've just run out of decent rules to, to make in the game now? That's why we've got so many daft handball and offside rules. Because that rule makes complete sense. Stop passing it back to the keeper and wasting time. Yep. Great. That is, a, that is an improvement to the game of football. Yeah. Right? But now if you're a toenail offside or you, <laughs> you the, the, the ball whisks past an arm hair, it's handball now. It's just making up daft rules now. So, yep. you know. I hope they can bring back some rules that make sense. But yeah, I know what you mean. That's uh, yeah. possibly, probably could have come yeah. from there. Probably like slowly, slowly it's built up from not being able to just waste time by passing it back to the keeper. And now they've got to play it forward out of the defense. And it's just, it's also come with something I'm going to mention from the next one I've just thought of as well. So, the, the, you know, the, the way that tactics have changed over time. Yeah. There's a lot more need and there's a lot more space further back on the pitch now. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because I say further back, but again, again, there's, there's, there's sort of not at the same time with some teams. But if you're a, a bigger team playing against a smaller team, we saw it the other night, which isn't a bigger team playing against a smaller team, but when City played Leicester the other night, yeah. there was a stat in that game, by the way, for the last five minutes of the game, Man City had 100% of the possession. I've never seen that in my life. Wow. But it popped up on the TV. City, 100% of the possession. Leicester didn't touch the ball. But anyway, usually, especially a team like Leicester anyway, you've got mm teams in both halves but now when a, a larger team plays against one of the smaller teams they just tend to sit back park the bus yeah. right sit yeah. back and just invite the pressure on so the defenders have got a lot more space to push up and to work in now 
Yeah. Now I don't remember. Obviously, my memory from is is my my main memories of football are from the early two thousands onwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Obviously, I remember football in the nineties, but I wasn't into the tactical side of the game in the nineties. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I was ten years old or whatever it was. So football knowledge sort of came into it through the mid 2000s tactical side of things and things like that. So I don't really remember yeah. or remember how teams shaped up and how different formations of the 442 were back in the 90s or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah. Um but as as I've learned more about football and it's sort of dropped back and dropped back then seeing the teams playing like this as as sort of opened things up and allowed defenders to to move into more space, you know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe that's where them needing to pass has come in a bit more. Cool. So number three, we've got passing accuracy, essentially. Being able yeah. to kick a ball with some degree of com- <laughs> composure. Let's go where it's going to land, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knowing what you're doing as opposed to just putting a foot through. Um, cool. Number four. Number four, you've got to be able to press all over the pitch. Now, as I said then, the attack starts at the keeper now but the defense yeah. starts at the striker now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not anymore like it was back in the day, separated. You've got your four or five players that will defend. You've got yeah. your four or five players that will attack. Yeah. Right. I remember when I used to play 11-a-side football and I used to play up front, we'd play two up front, we'd stand on the halfway line and we'd yeah. wait for one of the defenders to get the ball and then we'd look then to start making a move. Yeah. Right, that's that's how we used to do it. You know, we, I, me, and whoever my strike partner was would keep within the ten yards of each other. Wherever we moved, would be ten yards. Yeah, yeah. With each other, and that's that's how you played up front then. Yeah. Now, since it's moved to more of a, say, one up front or a three up front with the two out wide that most teams play now, yeah. sort of the, the outside strikers, I guess you call them, or inverted wingers, or whatever you might want to call them now. Mm-hmm. Defending has changed, and now that most teams are, are pushing forward from defence. The yeah. defense has to start from the front. And obviously, Jurgen Klopp with his Gingen, Gagen press or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. Pep Guardiola with his pressing all over the, the, the pitch. These, yeah. every player now is involved in the defense. And again, yeah. like we said with goalkeepers earlier, that some goalkeepers are kind of being left behind with just being yeah. shot stoppers. We're seeing more attacking players sort of being left behind with that now that can't press. You know, you sort yeah. of, I can't imagine, and you know, I'm sure he's a, a lovely guy and he was a great player for his time. I can't imagine Peter Crouch being a great presser of the ball. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? I no, can't no, imagine no. Chasing, their, chasing down defenders. You know, these tall, big, uh, even Alan Shearer. I can't imagine someone like Alan Shearer being a great presser of the ball. Obviously, no. an amazing, amazing striker and player from that era of, of football. Yeah. But I can't imagine him playing in today's game and being as effective as he was back then because the game is obviously completely different now. Yes. So yeah, for no. today's game, you have to be able to press all over the pitch and everyone has to put a shift in. So in my eye, everyone, you have to, everyone has to put a shift in defensively now as well as offensively. Yeah. Cool. So I've, I've got that press. I've got press in there. I've, I've kind of highlighted next to it with the work rate stamina because obviously yeah, okay. that's, if you've got a, a high work rate and a high stamina level, your chances are you're going to be pressing. That's why you've got mm-hmm. it, isn't it? So, Cool. Okay. So, yeah, pressing number five. Number five. Number five. You have to have, an, and again, it's such a basic thing, but you have to, to know, although I said before you have to be able to play in multiple positions, Yeah. you have to know specifically what you're being asked to do and how that contributes to your overall team tactically, right? I said you can't... In- able to interpret what's required interpret. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So imagine you're playing in a Jurgen Klopp team. Now, everyone yeah. gives Roberto Firmino, and I, I, I'm not going to sit here and praise Liverpool for too long, obviously, but obviously <laughs> they're a great... They were past, Maybe not this year, but the past couple of years, yeah, they've yeah. been a great team. And they've been a great team because they their, their, their system works exactly as the manager puts out the system and the players yeah. work to that system. And yeah. I'd say the same for Pep Guardiola. I'd say the same for... Any successful manager now has a style of play in place and he buys players that will fit that system. So yes. Roberto Firmino, everyone gets on Roberto Firmino's back because he doesn't score a lot of goals. But you mm-hmm. talk to any Liverpool fan over the past couple of years and they'll tell you how important Roberto Firmino has been to that system because it's not him that scores the goals. It's Salah and Mane that scores the goals. Yeah, yeah. 
but he's there to pick up the ball and get the ball to Salah and Mane in a dangerous position for them yep. to score. Yeah. Right. If he doesn't do that, then that system doesn't work. Exactly right. If yeah. our if our fullbacks don't overlap our wingers to allow them to cut in and get into the box for our fullbacks to smash in a low cross, yeah, we don't get as many goals from low crosses as we score. Man City's yeah. tactic is really, really simple. Overlap yeah. on the defender, smash the ball in a low across the box, and get someone on the end of it to put in the back of the net. Yeah. We just do it really, really well so no one can stop us. Yeah, yeah. And no one's been able to, well, you know, very few people have been able to stop us so far. Yeah, yeah. But we need the players to have the knowledge and have the physical attributes as well. Like we said, the, the wingers, uh, the, the fullbacks overlapping and stuff like that. Yeah. To be able to fit into that system and take it on board. We've seen players that Pep's brought in. And again, people have a go at Pep for bringing people in and then shipping them out when he doesn't want them. It's because they don't yeah. fit the style. We yeah. had um, Claudio Bravo. He brought him in to play that keeper that can play with his feet. And he, he, he flopped big time. Yeah. So he bought someone in who can do it. We had Nolito in that first season that Pep was here. Yes. Nolito came in and he couldn't, he couldn't play that winger that he wanted him to be that will, that will yeah. sit out on the wing and then cut in and yeah. get in the box as fast as he can. Nolito was a winger. Yeah. Right? So he bought Leroy Sané in. Yeah. And Raheem Sterling in. He's bought Ferran Torres in now who can do all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phil Foden can do that stuff off the wing. Yeah. So they, they are playing... They, they have that tactical knowledge to be able to fit the system that's being asked of them. You can't just ignore, it's, again, it's a daft thing to say, but you can't just ignore what the manager wants now because if you don't do as you're asked, the whole thing won't work. And I think it's always what you're saying there about the amount of players that uh, Guardiola's bought in and then got rid of. I think it's key as well because if you're asking your team to play a different style of football to most other teams around the world or a more intense version of it, you have to sign someone to see if they can do it. You can't work it out from watching them play for their own team because they're going to be doing it differently. And I mean, he signed some very, very good players and then said, do you know what? Actually, no. Uh, Jesus Navas yeah. is another well, key one. Sign him, but you got rid of him. I, 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 thought was... he'd sign, I thought he'd signed Navas. No, it was Pellegrini that signed him. Pellegrini oh, signed him. Uh, okay. But, well, uh, yeah. Pep... Quickly, Pep quickly realised that he's he an out-and-out winger. Yeah. He's not going to be able to play on the left. Look at Sterling and Sané. When we had yeah. Sterling and Sané, they could yeah. swap over whenever you asked them to. Yeah, Mares, Mares and Sterling can swap over whenever you ask yeah. them to. Ferran Torres and Sterling, or whoever's playing on them wings, they can yeah. swap wings. They can play that false nine position. They can play all three positions yeah. up front, and they can do exactly as they're asked to. And even some of the midfielders. Uh, De Bruyne's been asked to play false nine. Gundogan, Phil Foden yeah. have all been asked yeah. to play that false nine as well. Yeah. So again, that's versatility, the first one that I mentioned, and knowing exactly what the manager wants from each of the positions that he's then going to put you in as well. Yeah. Key. Love it. So versatile, we've got the dedication, we've got the uh, the accuracy of a passing and kicking a ball. Um, Being able to kick a ball, good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> accurately, though, accurately. Everyone <laughs> true, can kick true. a ball. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, and then the pressing and then the interpretation of the requirements. Mm -hmm. Love yeah, it. Oh, I like that one. I like that. Love it. Um, Dave, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Guys, if yeah, you are not following Dave, every so often he gets a, a bit of love for football manager again. But at the moment, he is sailing the high seas on a regular basis with I am um, captain, captain of captain, the vessel captain of the vessel he goes and jumps on other people's ships and tells them he's the captain and then it's good entertainment watching him get frustrated that they can't play the game um, he's, i can't play the game most of the time so i can't blame them all the time <laughs> um his link to twitch is underneath him right now guys go give him a go give him a follow but for now back over to me in live time yeah thank you very much badgie take care bro